We are back. I don't know what happened. Something terrible happened, they tell me. Uh, but today, we have the great Bob Mould here. Uh, I am going to invite him in to the to the show. Uh, and we are going to start this sucker again. Um, for many of you, you might not know it. There he is. He's coming. Yay. All right. So I, I noticed, uh, cause I'm very good at this. I noticed at the top of the screen, there were like 60 people on and that is very, uh, out of character for us. And so, as you can see, we have a regular group of people. Yay. So, um, so, folks, I'm Jeff Edgers from the Washington Post. As you know, every Friday I do this, and uh, we're lucky enough to have Bob Mould here. Um, he's already heard me introduce him, but I'm going to do it again because I don't think anyone else did. Um, just uh, the quick introduction is uh, Bob in the 80s, we knew him from his famed group, Husker Du. Uh, that dissolved. He became a solo artist, uh, which is how I learned about him. Uh, and then he formed the band Sugar in the 90s, um, an amazing rock band, and uh, has continued making music uh, over the years. His 14th record is, is out now, and we have it right here, Blue Hearts. I played a little of it. Um, I know it's backwards here, but it's a very, uh, I would say dark, I mean, to, for, to use the word dark with your music would be maybe, uh, you know it's all on a scale but it's it, it feels like it feels like right now um and we were listening to a song uh when we started this show called american crisis yep. and um I, I want you to tell me about the roots of, of of that song it's uh it's just it feels like you wrote it last week but i know you didn't i know yeah so um american crisis was written in april of 2018 when i was living in berlin germany and it's one of those songs where I just started writing and five minutes later I looked down and I had all these words and I was like, oh, that's good enough. <laughs> um, you know, ostensibly it was written to be on the previous album, Sunshine Rock, that came out in the middle of last year. Uh, the two albums before Sunshine Rock were both really dark. I lost my dad and wrote about that. I lost my mom and wrote about that. So I moved to Berlin and said, I'm going to make a happy record. Sunshine Rock. I write this song, American Crisis. It doesn't really fit. So I put it in my back pocket and uh, it sat there smoldering, smoldering, 2019 Sunshine Rock touring, lots of lots of shows, lots of playing guitar going around the world. And around a year ago, I started to get this feeling of deja vu that we can dig in a little bit deeper about how the third year of Trump was feeling a lot like the third year of Reagan and the song American Crisis speaks about what the 1980s were like to me you know yeah. as, a young, as a young gay man you know certain of my sexuality very unclear of my sexual identity not sure where i fit if there was a community and how to get into it so anyway so this song uh we revisited the song for what became blue hearts we recorded the album in february it was done and dusted by march 1st we started putting the you know the the campaign in place for the record and in mid-april we chose american crisis to be the first track made a lyric video for it with a little bit of performance and it was supposed to be dropped on june 1st it was just a monday <laughs> and uh you know my publicist said to me oh my gosh they're going to re-announce record store day on june 1st we're going to get overwhelmed why don't we move it to june 3rd the wednesday and i thought yeah whatever two days no problem <laughs> And of course, June 1st was the Bible walk, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'm just, you know, and this is after, jo you know, Breonna Taylor and after George Floyd. And then we get the Bible walk and I'm like, y you can't write this stuff. Like, what am I supposed to do with this now? <laughs> but, you know, the thing that's amazing, I mean, about your work, and I, I can think of a handful of other artists in this way is, um, you can write a song about, uh, in any moment, and it appears and suddenly it's applicable to the moment that's just occurred. Does that make some yeah. sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's the, yeah, it's the tea leaves. It's the magic eight ball. Yes, no, I don't know. I mean, yeah, we're just, I mean, I think our job 
you know, as journalists, as writers, as artists or whatever, is you just write what you know, you know, you sort of take in the world around you. And I mean, a lot of topics are timeless. That song, I was so like, how did I, how did that happen? <laughs> and, it, and it was just, you know, I guess the, you know, the short answer is, it's about the 1980s. It's about me as, you know, a 17 year old kid growing up in a farm town in northern New York State, you know, where there were no people of color, everybody was the same, there wasn't a lot of opportunity. I was very lucky to get an underprivileged scholarship to go to McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Immediately, it was a whole new world of many, you know, races and creeds and cultures and identities. And I had to get up to speed real fast. I got in a band. I was gay. It was Reagan. I grew up around Reagan youth, 1978 at McAllister. Kids, kids with ties and briefcases. You know, I mean, I saw all this before. You know, so I mean, people don't really. I mean, and and you you've referenced being gay, but I mean, the fact is, you know, we live at a time where people are far more comfortable uh, exploring whatever identity they have, whatever their sexuality is, whatever their orientation. It's just it's a different world. In the 1980s in Norman, it was, uh, it, you know, it, it, I'm sorry, Malone, it was not, uh, it was not a comfortable thing for a kid, right? No, not in the, not, not when I was growing up. I mean, I had no role models. There were whispers about somebody being gay. There was whispers about a kid that got killed because he was gay. And, I, you know, I was just like, okay, I'm going to go to the city. You know, I'm going to go to, to, you know, I have to, I have to move now. I have, I, you know, I, I think I'm a bright guy. Maybe there's a place for me somewhere out in the world. And, you know, going to St. Paul was wonderful. It was a great opportunity. You know, it's where I met Grant Hart. It's where I met Greg Norton. We started Who's Could Do. And, you know, it's, I think to, you know, to sort of frame a couple different things for people, you know, as far as late 70s gay culture, I mean, you know, I, 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 I don't remember a whole lot of musical role models. You know, I mean, Elton John was bisexual. <gasps> You know, David Bowie was bisexual, <gasps> you know, uh, Jabriath, I didn't know about until later, you know, people like Tom Robinson and Jimmy Somerville over the late seventies and early eighties over time, people who, you know, were, were very political about being gay in their work. But, you know, I was in this band, punk rock band. We were trying to just, you know, amuse ourselves, you know, music at that time was, you know, very exclusive, very, very much, you know, private jets and cocaine and groupies and all that. And, you know, who's going to do, we were three pretty average looking guys from St. Paul, you know, and yeah. we had to figure out where our place was. And, you know, we spent a number of years befriending other bands when they would come on tour, you know, bands like the Dead Kennedys or Black Flag or DOA, you know, and, and we would become friends with them and they helped us out in the early eighties. And we went out and we became, you know, part of this community of, alternative music and underground musicians. And we were sort of building this world of our own because there was no place for us in that exclusive jet setting cocaine world. Right, now, you, and I just have to share with you, um, I, I mentioned one of our great investigative editors, really one of the best in the country is David Fallis. You, you, you heard of him, you know him, remember him? No, he was in a band called No Direction in Oklahoma. And he actually took oh my gosh. of you, and this is a photo he took of you uh in 1982 i guess yep um that could be that that could be a place called the crystal pistol i think that was actually i asked him what it was he, he took another picture of you at the crystal pistol but that was actually the armory okay this was the armory oh my gosh that i wonder if that was the 85 show where or 1984 where we played one note for an hour I wonder if it was that show. Could have, could have been. That could have been. And 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 I do remember. I do think he mentioned something about it. Did you play like something off Zen Arcade just for, like a straight that was hour? It. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a, it was like an E, like an octave E for about an hour. It's like Andy Kaufman reading all of The Great Gatsby, right? Yes. Yes. But the show. But the show. Why? Why I mentioned the Crystal Pistol in Tulsa is I remember, the first time Husker Du played there, someone rode a horse into the club. <laughs> like onto the dance floor. You wrote about that, right? I was so like, what? <laughs> but but yeah, but I mean, so you know, so I mean, in the late seventies, early eighties, that's what music looked like to me. 
And in the early 80s, as you know, as a gay kid, certain that I was attracted to other men, but not feeling connected to any kind of community or having any kind of role models. You know, and then Reagan, then the moral majority, the evangelicals, all of the backing and support they gave him to put him in power. And then those number of years where his administration could never say the word AIDS. And, you know, as a kid, that stuff really, you know, I remember being here where I live in San Francisco in the summer of 1981 when, you know, they started posting things on the wall at Star Pharmacy, you know, at 18th and Castro, which is now my my you know, formula chain drugstore. Um, it, uh, it was weird. I just didn't know how to process any of it. Um, I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the hardcore punk scene at the time was, it was very inclusive, you know, I mean, I mean, every, all of us misfits had a place, but I wasn't grabbing a sexual identity at that time. I mean, you know, the only in, in our cult, if I, if I remember right, in our culture, the big turning point, as sad as it is, is when Rock Hudson uh, uh, died and yep. suddenly Ronald Reagan was comfortable or as comfortable as he could have been acknowledging AIDS because that had been one of his buddies in, in Hollywood in the 50s, right? Yeah, so, so yeah, so it, took until, so it took all that time until it actually came home to him for him to recognize the severity of this. Which is 19, I mean, that's 1985. And then Bob, you also, um, and I just want to recommend to people because I'm in the plugging mood. Uh, your book, it, which mm -hmm. is just a beautiful piece of art, uh, but also everything you would want to understand about a time period and a way of thinking and a way of growing. But um, your book, uh, you talk about this. I mean, you really ultimately didn't come out until like 1994, right? I mean, yeah. Not 94, 94 was when publicly, you know, a uh, publication called Spin Magazine, big music paper in the 90s, and then still, you know, a good, good, a good source for music. They uh, came to me wanting to do the, st the story, you know, the, we could, you know, you can come out or we can bring you out or we can do this thing. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's do it. Let's talk about it. And there was a, a writer named Dennis Cooper's novelist came down to Austin, Texas, spent a couple of days in my home with me and my then partner and had a really good time and just talked and joked about things. But even then I still felt like, gosh, am I, am, am I now a, am I a gay musician or a musician who happens to be gay or, you know, what, what am I now? What am I going to be now? And I, and I mean, ultimately, it was the beginning of coming out. It feels like it's still, you know, it's a work in progress. I think, you know, somebody asked me around National Coming Out Day, well, what did it feel like? I said, you know, it just felt like a bunch of furniture falling over. You know, I'm <laughs> sort of, a, I'm sort of a socially awkward guy by nature. You know, I'm a little, <laughs> little introverted, a little, you know, a little, a little funny. I mean, I'm good when I'm doing this, but so, yeah, I mean, just tr to try to frame the whole thing for people with Blue Hearts is American Crisis being sort of the tent pole of this record that touches on a lot of subjects that are very current, you know, hypocrisy and religion, with especially with evangelicals, you know, it talks about the perils of technology, you know, I'm sort of mm -hmm. fascinated with the idea, am I talking, are you, is this a camera, is this a window, a mirror, a screen, this thing of glass that we yeah. use all the time, it takes on so many different roles in our life every day, and I'm always like, what, how, do, how do, do we see, do we see a reflection of ourselves when it's off, like, what is this? You, do, you, do you use, you've never done Instagram Live, are there things, I have sometimes people will say like, I won't do Zoom or I won't do Instagram or I won't, you know, but I'll do this. They have yeah, I, different, what is your, what is your uh, thought on all this? Cause I feel like we're being watched all the time anyway, right? I feel like we're being watched all the time anyway. So I don't do Zoom because I heard all kinds of weird things early on about it. Like people sort of bum rush in a conference call or where's the data really going? I mean, I, you know, I guess as an old guy, I sort of figured out on the internet, like all those surveys at the beginning, you know, like, Tell us all about yourself and you'll win a free prize, you know, like. Well, you had a very, there's a hilarious, uh, hilarious looking back at it. But I mean, you talk about in the early days of like basically meeting people online for relationships uh, mm -hmm. to meet them and uh, going out uh, driving like, I, I don't know how far you drove, but to meet this fellow who you thought oh, yeah. seemed like a, a nice enough guy. He and was. you get out there and, uh, uh, you know, he had kept canceling on you because his first his grandmother died. 
Uh, all kinds of stuff. His car <laughs> broke down. And then you get out there, and he's there. First of all, he looks nothing like on the, on the computer, right? And then nope. you go to his house, and his grandmother's there. And he's like, oh, that was my aunt, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. The, the early internet was amazing, right? Really crazy stuff. And, and it, yeah, and we all get ourselves into, you know, various levels of peril on it. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, the record talks about technology. It talks about relationships. I mean, it's a broad base record, but, you know, the hot spots on the record are definitely, you know, accidentally timely things, I guess, you know, with politics and, you know, the sort of the, the, the grave state of things right this moment. I mean, what'd you think of last night? Did you... Uh, yeah, I thought it was it was hard to get a beat on because I watched the first debate with uh, our son is uh, our youngest is 10. And I watched it, the first one with him for a while. And it was like such a train wreck that I was I was trying to explain to him not to almost like not to pay attention. And then like, OK, time for bed. And last night just felt a little sleepy, you know, but then I was like, maybe that's what it should be. Right. The yeah. problem that I find. And, uh, you know, the problem is that in the olden days, like. I don't know, four years ago, um, our country would argue, but it would argue about uh, facts. They would have opinions on facts. Now the problem is we really argue about what the facts are. And it's very hard to understand what makes a fact anymore. Because sometimes, um, you know, just repeating something over and over again, uh, it, it sinks in and people start to believe it's true. So you're sitting there and, you know, you can't trust any numbers anymore, right? Yeah. Um, you can't really be sure of what people's opinions were in the past. So you have to figure out a third process of deciding who you, you know, who you, who you support. I mean, yeah. I, just, I don't really like, uh, I'm the National Arts Reporter. I don't, I don't like being political. I feel like my job is not to be political and everybody has an opinion. But mm -hmm. um, I do feel like I've never seen things so completely broken and dysfunctional between the two sides. Yeah, it's it's really it's really disheartening. You know, I, I you know, in 2016 I moved from San Francisco to Berlin, Germany and spent, you know, 3 3 and a half years living there and it was a, it was an amazing experience and it was just the little things that would happen throughout the course of the 3 years, you know, like like sort of registering with the government you know getting my getting my residence visa and having to do paperwork down at city hall and you know i was working on the paperwork with a friend of mine and there was a question and i was like what, well what's this question they're like are you religious and i and they're like be sure to put no on that and i said i said well i i, I said i'm not particularly religious at the moment but why why would i put no they're like, because if you put yes, then they they ask for an extra tax. Huh. And what happens is, is they collect sort of the tithe and then they distribute it to the various religions in well, Germany. That is, I mean, who even thought of that, right? Uh, well, it's a good it's a good way to keep it all legitimate. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. It is a good way to, but and you, well, and you, know, it would, you know, it would be stuff like that, or even like going to get like health insurance, which was mandatory. And because I wasn't able to work because I was there as an artist, I had to buy my own insurance and I had to buy like the premium coverage. Yeah. It's one third of what I pay here. Huh? And people who are in the national system, it's maybe one tenth of what we pay here. So that's what happens when everybody actually has to have health insurance hmm. and buy well, you, you, you move um i mean uh it's like when i read that book uh and just consider your life it feels like you're always moving right? yes yeah is, pretty much is that you're in san francisco now is that a restlessness is it um you get tired of different places uh, do different places give you inspiration and then uh, sort of have no you know you feel like it's time to roll i mean you, you it feels like you're always moving yeah, I mean, it's 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 the luxury of being self-employed and, and being in a business where I can live out of a suitcase or live, you know, ha live with very, you know, very minimal means and objects around me. Um, I mean, ultimately, it's just the, it's the beauty of new experiences for me. You know, San Francisco, I've been here on and off now 10 years, which is the longest, I think, you know, D.C. I was in for seven years before that. 
it was a wonderful city. I loved living in DC, just the, the, the whole vibe, although it was the W years, which was a little weird. It was a little oppressive, but, um, you know, living in New York City was wonderful. It's, I, I really thrive on like new experiences and new people and just having to adjust to different ways of life. I mean, I'm a city person by nature because I grew up on the farm. I did have a farm up in Minnesota for a year and a half, and that was sort of a crazy time too, yeah. 1988, 89. But um, yeah, I think it's just it's the 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 it's a it's a it's one of the one of the great luxuries that I have is just being able to pick up and it's like oh I wonder what it would be like to live in the desert. I wonder what it'd be like to live in you know a country where I don't speak the language like Germany and throw myself into their into their world and just you learn a lot of new things that way i guess i never got that season abroad like a lot of people did so right i mean you went to uh, and and you know i i was struck that you went to McAllister for a year because that is a very good school i mean you obviously were a gifted student who could have done any, anything you wanted to right um i think i was an okay student i i tested well um it was an under, they had a quota for underprivileged kids. And so I got the underprivileged scholarship because I grew up in poverty. So that was the, uh, that was the way in. But yeah, I mean, uh, Mondale taught there, Humphrey taught there, Kofi Annan went there. So had a really good, you know, political science, liberal arts. I did not, you know. I'm just going to tell you, I did not get into McAllister as, as, as much as I wanted to. I love, I don't know what it was about McAllister, but I love, I thought that school would be fantastic. Bob, I have, I'm going to try something. Okay. Okay. All right. So I know I asked you if you would perform and you, I know you don't do that. You're not a jukebox. We understand that. But what? I, so I was lucky enough to get uh, you to perform and I just want to uh, share this with you. You can see it, right? Yeah. Right. What are you doing? All right. Here we go. Bob a little early for the holidays, but this is my rendition of Jingle Bells. Wow, Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse fence sleigh. Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle all the way. Hey, oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. In a one-horse, ha, ha. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's your good. That's your good buddy Fred Armiston. Who? Uh, what? Yeah, that's who he is. Look, he's he actually. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Oh my god, I thought I thought that was Steve Schmidt. He sent me that picture um, uh, yesterday because he was uh, he wanted you to know that he is um, Fred Armiston, who is the great uh, comedian, but also is is an excellent musician. He was in. Um, where are you going? You going somewhere? Yeah, yeah I'm going over here. I'm going to surprise um, he was, you. Uh, Fred is in a hotel in Vancouver, and uh, I told him you were going to be on here, and, he's, and he sent me that. He sent me that oh clip, which gosh. I think is... That's, that's so sweet of him to do. Thank you, Fred. And he's also, um, he said he wanted to show you that picture because he said he's shaving the, the Bob beard today. Oh, my uh, God. That's amazing. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Uh, let's see. Are you gonna? Are you, you picked up a guitar there. Is that what you did? See, hey, I I I I faked you out, didn't I? Bob, hey, you, I, you, it's you, a, you'll it's play a, something for us. It's a whole new. It's a awesome. whole. It's a whole new set. <laughs> it's a whole new set. I like it, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hold this up while you play a little bit. Okay, what are you gonna play for us? Can, I, can you take requests? Um. Well, I was gonna. I was gonna show. I was gonna show. It's like a sort of a. I'm a very private person. I would never normally do something like this, but I know this is a big deal for, for me and for everybody. So I thought I would show you where I do my work. This is sort of where I set up and do all of my writing. It's, uh, it's my little, uh, it's my little, uh, my little, uh, rural getaway in the middle of San Francisco. And, um, I don't know. So, I mean, we were talking when you mentioned songwriting before I was, you know, sort of, talk about that a little bit just in the terms of like people say well what how do you write a song like I've got friends that are like I want to be a songwriter how do I write songs like everything I write is so it's just like you have to write what you know you have to sort of you know just call on your experiences and for me as a songwriter how I look at this process and I try to explain this to people is I'm the guy with the bucket and when it starts to rain 
I go outside and I catch the water. And when the bucket is full, I bring the bucket back in and I set it down. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. I might drink it. I might wash my car with it. I might water some plants with it. But the thing about writing is you just have to, when it starts to rain, you got to get out and you have to ca you catch the moments, right? Hmm. And you hold on to them. And then later on, you figure it out. It's like songwriting is this multi-step process. You know, I mean, you're, you, you write, right? And when you're just writing, you don't, you don't like, oh, I got to stop and edit that. Well, I think that the problem <laughs> is that um, the biggest barrier for me as a writer is lowering my standards and accepting that sometimes I write badly. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that, then I can soldier through it and I don't sit there going, oh, I've got writer's block. I don't believe there's writer's block. There's just bad writing. They're, they're, or, yeah, and, and, or, or not applying oneself to the craft on a regular basis. Because if you don't have the tools, how can you do your work? So you got to have your stuff handy all the time. But anyways, so I was going to show people, um, there's a song on the record called Forecast of Rain. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of times when I'm writing at home, I do these things with, uh, where I'm using like sort of drum machines and, you know, fake strings and stuff. So, I, you know, I'll have a song and it'll have parts in it that, you know, you're like, oh. all these like crazy little things that you can never hear on the records because the guitars are so loud so i'm gonna i'm gonna do my jukebox thing for you i'd love oh my god sure can i do a thing and you know, i just play a song and sort of play along with my demo track do it up i'd love to hear that'll it. Yeah. be cool I, I think it'll probably work let me see i may have it too loud that's about right so then you do these things and you give them to other people Almighty. drum machine put down click track start writing some stuff and then when i get these sort of in a shape i send these to john worcester my drummer jason narducey my bass player and say 
okay, here's the thing. It's one of these, it's a six and a half, 13 bar verse, 13 bar chorus, you know, and this is the structure and do whatever you want with it. Do you, do you um, uh, I mean, you've done both over the years, but obviously this new record is, um, it's a band record. It's, it sounds like mm -hmm. a band record. It feels oh, yeah. like a band record. <laughs> Uh, do you, um, uh, how do you decide, look, I think I can do all this stuff in my home studio. I'm going to use some of these electronic instruments. I'm going to just craft it my own way. And how do you decide this is a band record? This is what, this is what I want it to sound like. Um, well, I mean, I went through a period in the two thousands where I was making records backwards, where I would put drums on last, you know, I do everything sort of at home and then, and then put drums in, um, with something like Blue Hearts. I mean, it's, this is a built for the stage sort of punk rock record. Hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of times it's the material, you know, I mean, when you listen to this record, you can hear the three of us in the room hmm. bashing this stuff out. You know, it's like very, 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 very physical and, you know, subject matter had a lot to do with it, but, I mean, there's all all different ways to make these records, you know. It's Bob, does it uh, does it bug you when uh, you read? I don't know if you even read these things, but like, so a record like this, uh, um, people say, uh, "Oh, it's it's his most ho Husker do like since 1986." You know, you you know those comparisons, right? Anytime you put an electric guitar on there, they're they're going to do that sort of thing. Was there a period of time you shied away from? trying to sound like that band? And is there a, a, a kind of like piece you're at with those comparisons now? Yeah, um, well, I think the biggest break was 1988 when I left Husker Du and that was, you know, I mean, the band was going to end. It was just a matter of who said I'm out first. And I sort of said, oh, I'll leave. And for the year and a half following that between leaving Husker Du and releasing Workbook, my first solo album was a real, uh, yeah, real conscious effort not to be that guy like why would i leave a band as well known and revered as husker du was just to have a you know have a have another record that sounds just like it what'd you just grab this, so <laughs> it's this it's this set i want to talk about this because ah, oh, that's where Bob, it starts <laughs> it's kind of amazing i don't really um so i'll just tell you i mean i'm 49 and uh i was too young to go see husker du play i mean i guess i could have mm -hmm. snuck in but i was just some kid in the suburbs so um uh for me the entry point to you was in the olden days i don't know if kids realize this but you would read rolling stone and you'd be like oh my god they said that's four stars and i'd say i gotta get that and i got this book this this album workbook which it's very hard to see the real cover is, uh -huh this sort of Joseph Cornell light box, which is quite beautiful. But I remember putting this record on and it was one of the most beautiful records I'd ever heard because um, you opened it up with like a finger picking song, Sunspots, and you had songs that uh, really went from melancholic acoustic to dark. And I hadn't heard things like that in my life. And this is just so people know, this just came out, I think it came out today. This is the first vinyl version uh, of this new retrospective, which, I mean, this is like, you couldn't find something better. Uh, it goes from Workbook to Black Sheets of Rain, your two first solo records. Mm -hmm. It's got all the Sugar records on there and then some B-sides and so uh, uh, it's just beautiful. So, yeah. you, wait, did you pick love. that sucker up? The blue guitar, right? There it is. It's It stays at home now. Look at that, somebody dropped it, that big oh. chunk. Somebody, can't, can't dropped, it. It, Somebody right? dropped it again. There's a big split in the seam there. Uh, fretboard's completely destroyed. But you don't <laughs> but you don't change these things, right? So you still use that guitar, right? Only at home. Yeah. That's Only I mean home. you went I, I just am curious if you could just explain to people, you go from being in this like, you know, punk rock band that is just the definition of thrashing and also melodic. I mean, let's be fair, but you go into this farmhouse in Minnesota and reinvent yourself. What, what is going on there? Tell me how you do that. Well, it was, it was just sort of de denying my own natural language as a musician. You know, I started working a lot with keyboards trying to, I mean, there were like, I've got like hours and hours of like orchestral music that I was trying to write. I mean, I was trying to, you know, I was doing weird stuff like covering Petula Clark sign of the times with synthesizers you know i mean you know i was trying i was making stuff that sounded like i guess industrial music 
Hmm. And then I started, and then I started uh, listening to a lot of world music. Uh, I had a friend who worked at Nunsuch, and they sent me boxes of all this, you know, Celtic music, you know, you know, Galax, Virginia, Appalachian, bluegrass, and you know, and all these musics with sort of drones and modalities that started to shape the way that I was looking at my writing. I was writing a lot of short stories and poetry. And then the way that I was folding words and music together was completely different than anything I had done before. You know, I would just start improvising on a guitar with words and just reading certain lines. And then all of a sudden I got wishing well. I'm like, oh, well, that happened nice. Mm. So Which it was well, uh, that, that's the that's the, that's an example of a song that just goes from uh, there's something so dark about that song and beautiful. Um, I mean, most of us heard uh, "See a Little Light" was the big was one of your, must be your biggest solo hit. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah the song, the book, the movie. Yeah. It's the title. <laughs> it's the title that gets repurposed. <laughs> yeah. Um. It's. Uh, I mean, that record really opened it up. And Bob, you know, I have to ask you. I I remember I saw Sugar in the early '90s, and um, I had a backstage pass because I was like at some newspaper at that time. I was very young, and um, I remember I was with a friend, and they were like, "Let's go back." And I can't tell you how. First of all, I did not. I was. I I watched you on stage, and I've got to be honest. I was terrified of meeting you. You looked like one of the most. Uh, you. It looked like you would bite my head off. Good. Uh, and and <laughs> is is I mean I know from reading your book and I know from talking with you you're a sweet person uh, and very introspective but would that guy have bitten my head off what what goes on when you're on that stage with that guitar when I'm on the stage with the guitar I, have, I really have no idea I mean there's that there's that thing about minutes before the show sort of taking my tea doing my stretching double knot everything move your belt over out of the way of your guitar so you don't scratch up the finish and then you're doing your warm-ups your calisthenics you're stretching you're doing your stuff and then you're standing right on the edge of the light and then the light goes down and the other lights come up and you walk out there and when i make that transition i really don't have much of a handle on the person that steps on the stage hmm. it's pretty it's pretty visceral it's pretty it's pretty amazing. I mean, I really don't understand it. You know, I, you've I, given you've you've decided over the I mean, at one point, I think in 98 ish or something, you were like, I'm not doing any more electric band stuff. You yep. um, I know that you f have physically like injured yourself. Uh, you've made yourself sick physically from performance, right? Yeah, yeah I've done a lot of, a lot of things. Yeah, yelling and screaming and blood, busting blood vessels and losing my voice. And yeah, I mean, that that all that kind of stuff. Yeah. What, well, what, 1998, what, 1998, what happened was it was about 20 years into my career and, uh, you know, going back to sort of my lack of a true sexual identity. You know, I was, I moved back to New York City and was spending a lot of time in the West Village and in Chelsea, which were the gay neighborhoods at that time. And I, I really wanted to not just be the rock guitar guy who lives in the van and tours all over the world. As amazing as that is, I was like, you know, I'm almost 40. I sort of want to hang out with the gay guys. I want to go to the gym and start looking better and feeling better and, and see if I can, you know, sort of get this identity for myself. And that was the reason I put down the guitar. Bob, I, I, <coughs> I, I have a, do you have time for a quiz? Yeah, sure. All right, look, I'm going to show you guys, I'm going to show you a few guys and I want you to identify them. Okay. Can you do this for me? Uh, Iron Sheet. Okay. Nikolai Volkov. Oh my yeah. gosh! How's, what's it's like? It's it's, it's xenoph xenophobic WWF heels from the early '80s. Captain Lou. That's easy. And then, of course, oh, Hulk. Hulk. I know. Oh, well, what was that? Don't no. I know. I know. Hulk. For God's sakes, yeah, Bob. I don't know if people know. I had a second. I had a second phone. I call him right now. Uh, <laughs> the uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think people realize this, but you were. Was it a create your creative consultant basically? Mm -hmm. And what was it for the WCW? Yeah, it was a company called WCW. Uh, originally, that was like the National Wrestling Alliance, which was like a worldwide company like WWE is now, you know, back in the through the 20th century. And then they got bought by Ted Turner, became World Championship Wrestling. I had lifelong fan of the business, student of the business, I had friends in the business. 
And I got a call in September of 99. They asked me and said, oh, you know, the executive vice president's going on hiatus. Do you want to come in as the creative consultant for the company? I was like, uh, you sure about this? And they said, yeah, we want, we want your opinions. We want your ideas. So I got in. I flew down to Atlanta and very quickly learned everything that I didn't know about professional wrestling, which was a lot, even though I thought I knew a lot. And uh, it's a crazy world. It's a crazy world, you know. You, you were actually, I mean, you were on steroids for a while, right? I mean, you were like in the world of wrestling, taking steroids, going up to Hulk Hogan and giving him storylines. I, I mean, tried. You just, what, what, it, I mean, your title was consultant, but you were running the show. Um, well, yeah, so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a job. It's called, it, there's, a, there's a thing in wrestling called the gorilla position. And there was a WWF wrestler, Gorilla Monsoon, who was sort of the guy who kept the show running on time. In the in the old days, before wireless earpieces, they used to send somebody down to ringside to fluff their tie, which was like, okay, you guys, two more minutes and you're done. Go to your predetermined finish. But Gorilla, in WWE, Vince McMahon sits at Gorilla on the headset, watching the time code, telling the refs to tell the guys and blah, 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 blah. So I got put in that position because I was good with math, you know, so because <laughs> I could watch the time code and hit our commercial breaks. Right. So and I could do all that on the fly and I could remember all the stories and remember the blocking and how to cue everybody. And it was pretty nuts. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. It was pretty what crazy. you're telling me, I, what you're telling me is this is not wrestling is not real. No, everything. It's all real. It's, it's predetermined. It's choreographed. It's cooperative. It's um, <laughs> and the funny the things that people like the little things about pro wrestling that are really crazy are like when you watch it and the blood feuds where people are literally killing each other for real, they're best friends. <laughs> it's, it's the ones where it's because you have, because in that environment, those guys have to absolutely trust each other with their lives and their bodies. Hmm. Because I mean, what happens if you're really mad at somebody and you've got them up and you go, Oh, I'll just drop you on your head instead. So it's, it's, it, it, what what can you tell us about this guy? You like you talk to Hulk? Hulk, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, like I'd, be, I'd be I'd be I'd be I'd be sitting I'd be sitting at Gorilla and it'd be he'd be coming up next and I'd just feel the two brother Bob. Yeah, <laughs> it's hey, so Hulk. amazing to me. Hey um, Hulk, it's so, yeah, top to bottom, twelve minutes. How much go home do you need? Three minutes. I'm gonna ask you, okay. <laughs> Bob, I'm gonna give you a few questions. They might. I'm gonna see fans have written in here. And okay. I'm gonna self I'm gonna self edit them. So right. if they're good, I don't know if they're gonna be good. Right. Uh, let's see. Uh, so far, these questions are not so good. Um, they're kind of let's see. Da, da, da. Uh, what what program do you use when you're making your music on the computer? Someone wants to know. I use three different programs. I use digital perform. I use Mark of the Unicorn digital performer as my multi track. I use Propellerheads Reason as my synth bank. And I use Ableton Live for looping and time correcting. So three different packages. Um, okay, someone is asking, uh, this person, Renato, is asking, any chances of you ever releasing a folk album in the vein of workbook? Um, anything can happen. Probably, you know, I mean, if, I, if, I, if I'm lucky enough to make more records, that might be, you know, it's a good possibility. Uh, Bob, with with Husker Du, obviously Grant Hart is no longer alive. Um, you're pretty un, un, unflinchingly don't look back at that band in a way that you wanted, you know, we've seen everybody except for maybe the Kinks go back and, and perform again. Uh, I assume you were offered huge chunks of money over the years to put that band together again, right? There were one or two occasions where people had you know, had, had made nice gestures to try to get the band back together, yeah. I assume you do not regret at all not doing that, uh, uh, considering how it ended and, and what legacy you left there. Uh, yeah, not so, not so much the former, but much more the latter. You know, when you, a band like Who's Do that was so, to me, really an amazing band, and so of a period in time, speaking to a period in time, and, you know, so many people think so highly of that band. Why would anybody in their right mind take a chance in changing that legacy by doing something that looks less than what people remember? 
Yeah, I hear you. It's very rare that a band comes back and and can do it the way that you want them to. You know? Yeah, I mean, and that I mean that was a, that was a great band, and you know, the three of us did a lot of good. I think we did a lot of good for the world of music. You know, I I as a kid and even today. I really do believe we're, you know, that music can change the world. And that's, you know, we sort of fell into that spot in the 80s and, you know, really helped, helped a lot of our friends, helped build a, a completely different world of music that, you know, a lot of people years after, I guess, Nirvana and Pixies being the two that I think of right away, you know, really took that template and that methodology and those ideas and really took it to the mainstream. And then it's, you know, it's, it's sort of been a, you know, sort of a pillar of music now. And why, why would I mess with that? I saw, um, I, I saw the David Byrne uh, show, American Utopia, um, last year, a couple times. You see that show? No, I know, I know about it, but I have not seen it yet. And uh, I wasn't, again, I was too young for Talking Heads. So I was like, I always thought, oh, it'd be so cool to see them. And then you watch him play with his band and um, they're, amazing musicians mm -hmm. and you watch them after the show and you watch them hanging out and you realize and they like each other uh mm -hmm. so why would you want to go go back and do it again and i think about your band now those guys are they got to be the best musicians you play i mean you know you don't want to slide anyone but those two guys have to be right up there with the best you've played with uh yeah john worcester jason narducey i mean it's it's so much of what made these five records with merge you know from silver age beauty and rune patch the sky sunshine rock and now blue hearts i mean it's it's the fact that we all love music we get along great we speak the same language of music we all grew up roughly in the same era of music and a lot of times when I've got an idea, I'm like, hey, how about this? And they're just like, oh, yep, yeah, we know how, if that's you, we know, we know how to play that. I mean, right. they bring, they bring so much, they bring so much to the whole thing. It's really, really something. I'm getting all, I'm getting all my products here. So, um, Bob, you know, I feel like we could do this for like six hours. I mean, you probably have things to do, but I would, I, we didn't even scratch the surface of what we're, this, there's a pandemic going on, you know? Uh, and uh, but we can't do it any longer because Instagram will punish us. Um, I so I just want to recommend to people that you get this record right right here. Uh, it's backwards, but uh, it's not backwards if you buy it. You know, there's an Aerosmith record from the mid '80s, Done with Mirrors. I remember I got it when I was 14. Yeah. And you remember that record? Yep. They made. It, they thought it would be clever. All the typeset was backwards. I, when, I remember. And when I say that. It was like, even if you open up the liner notes and it was like the, all the credits, like in the lyrics, all backwards. Like, you yeah. you know, oh, I get it. We're supposed to, you know, put it up against the mirror. But I was 14 years old. I didn't understand that was cocaine. I thought yeah. it was just, why did they do this? Um, you could also, I'll probably just give this to Bob. It's it's an eight track version that I think doesn't That's exist. So but awesome. this is uh, 13.99. That is okay. so awesome. That's amazing. Um, Hey, I'm so, uh, I, I really, all, you know, all joking aside, you are a hero of uh, so many of us, including me, and I'm so grateful that you you, you spent the time with us. And um, I hope the next time we see each other is like in person, you know, and you're on stage scaring me again. I hope so. I hope so. And, you know, to everybody out there, please, the mask is good. The distance is good. Washing the hands is good. Voting is the best. We need to vote. Yes, we need to do some voting here, folks. Dr. Fauci, my Dr. Fa my Dr. Fauci mug. Awesome dude. Awesome <clears throat> dude. That's who I'm listening to. Well, let's stay yeah. safe and uh, let's stay safe. And, uh, you know, maybe you'll get another record out of this thing and we'll uh, and we'll see you uh, out on the road soon. So, Bob, thank you so much. OK, Jeff, it's been a wonderful time. Thank you so much.